welcome to our Biz Huddle podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Cuthbert, Creative Director at Baker Creative. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit subscribe so you can get notified when new content comes out. Please share this with anyone who could be inspired by it. Steve Stivers became President and Chief Executive Officer of the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. Previously, he represented Ohio's 15th Congressional District from 2011 to 2021 and served in the Ohio Senate. He is a Major General in the Ohio Army National Guard, earning the Bronze Star for leadership during his Operation Iraq Freedom Deployment. Stivers received a bachelor's degree and an MBA from The Ohio State University and a master's degree in strategic studies from the Army War College. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, Steve. Thanks so much for joining us on our podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, it's great to be on, Michelle. And, uh, you know, it's uh, great to have a chance to talk about the issues that are affecting Ohio companies. That's uh, what I spend most of my, my days doing these days. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, did growing up in the village of Ripley, how did that really shape your life? So Ripley's a town of 2,500 people on the banks of the Ohio River in Brown County, halfway between Cincinnati and Portsmouth, a great little town to be from. Uh, You know, it really fundamentally shaped my life because uh, it was my formative experience. And in when you grow up in a town of 2,500 people and there's 100 people in your class, uh, everybody knows everything about you. Uh, good, bad, ugly. Uh, and you know, I think that had a profound impact on me to help me understand, you know, you've got to be the same person, you know, in front of one person as you are in front of other people. There are a lot of people who get too far in life thinking they can be one person in public and another person in private. And the great thing about growing up in a small town is you can't do that because everybody knows everything about you. The other thing that's great about growing up in a small town is you get to try a lot of things. And, you know, I was on the track team one day and uh, we were on a bus going to a meet and uh, the pole vaulter didn't, didn't make it that day. And they were like, does anybody want to try pole vaulting? I'm like, I'll try. So, you know, the great thing about being in a small town is you get to do a lot of things. I was an Eagle Scout. I played baseball. I played basketball. I ran track and cross country. I was on the journalism team for the, for the school newspaper. Um, so I got to do, I delivered papers every evening when I got home from school. So, you know, the great thing about a little town is you get to do a lot of cool things. You get to try things and you figure out what you like and what you don't like. Uh, when I was in high school, I also met our local state senator and he offered me an opportunity to be a page in the state Senate. Uh, if I was in or around Columbus, which is one of the reasons I chose to go to the Ohio State University. I looked at Ohio State, I looked at Miami University, I looked at Denison and Ohio Wesleyan, and I chose Ohio State uh, in part because it was closer to the state house in Columbus, and in part because it was a little cheaper and I was gonna have to pay part of my own way, which is why I joined the National Guard when I got to school to help pay for college and. I'm still in, you know, 34 years later. So your life in that military service, how's that translated into what you do today? The military has been an amazing experience for me. And a lot of my leadership uh, experiences, I I learned in the military. You know, I went to officer candidate school. I was a, uh, so I was enlisted first and I went to officer candidate school and you started as an officer, as a second lieutenant, and and have worked my way up to major general over a a long career. But, um, you know, the military is really good at a couple things. They're good at teamwork, and they're good at training. And so all the leadership training that I've received, and some of the best leadership training I've ever received, has been in the military. And I've really tried to take those lessons to heart, to understand your values matter, and your leadership style matters. And you've got to figure out how to win. Like Woody Hayes said, you win with people. But I learned that in the military that uh, you got to keep the soldiers happy and make sure the soldiers know, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines know what they're supposed to be doing, know their mission, and have some latitude to make some decisions 
inside that mission, tell them what needs done, don't tell them necessarily how to do it and uh, tell them what the outcome you want is and you usually get a better outcome because the people who are doing the work every day can figure out how to do it most effectively and you don't need to micromanage. So that's the great lessons of the military are about mission accomplishment and, and not micromanaging your people. And those are the lessons I've taken away, whether I'm leading the Chamber of Commerce or serving the people in the halls of Congress or in the State House. It's uh, the military really has been my leadership training for my entire life. Now, how serving the Senate, how has that impact when you had to go ahead and serve in Congress? Well, you know, I, I learned how to be a legislator as a state senator. So I had never been a legislator before and was elected, uh, appointed and then elected to the state Senate. And I got a chance to go in and, you know, see how things work and, and pass laws. I passed 17 bills as a state senator over six years. I'm proud of getting those things done. Uh, and I knew how to, you know, take a concept, turn it into a bill, create a coalition, uh, sell my bill and get it passed and signed into law. And I, as I said, I did it 17 times in uh, six years in the state Senate and 22 times in Congress uh, over almost a little over a decade. Was there one thing out of all those accomplishments that stands out in your mind that you're like, man, I, I really thought that was like the coolest thing? Well, at the state level, my first bill that I introduced, Senate Bill 80, that uh, was comprehensive tort reform, I think really fundamentally changed the business climate in Ohio in a very positive way. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, you know, I passed a lot of bills in Congress, but the one I'm probably proudest of in Congress is a bill that helped get service dogs to our veterans that have post-traumatic stress. Uh, and these service dogs can do amazing things to transform lives. And while I, you know, did a lot of bills to help people get access to housing and get uh, to make uh, our financial system work better, to help our veterans. That's the one I think I'm most proud of in Congress. So how did you transition from that kind of life to where you're at now? What made you decide I need to change? Well, I'd been in Congress about 12 years and I got a call from the folks at the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, their CEO, who'd been here 28 years, was retiring. And I thought, well, I'll go hear him out. I'm, I'm not really looking for a job, but I'll go hear him out. And I did. And I was super excited about the opportunity to help make Ohio the best place to start a business or operate a business anywhere in the country. And, um, you know, I, after talking to him a couple of times, I really decided it would be a great opportunity for me. And it was a great opportunity personally as well, because when I was in Congress, I was hopping on a plane Monday morning and you know, coming back Thursday or Friday, and I'd see my kids and my wife Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then hop on a plane the next Monday. So uh, this gives me a chance to be in the same city as my wife and kids every day, spend more time with my family, but still have a chance to be involved in uh, a mission-driven life to make Ohio a better place, which um, you know is something I get excited about every day, and uh, I'm super excited to make Ohio the best place to own and operate a business anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. So it's uh, a mission that I believe in, championing free enterprise and focusing on making Ohio a better place that can serve all 11 and a half million people uh, and give them a chance to live their dreams right here in Ohio. I think that's pretty awesome. I mean, really. It's, it's been a great transition. I've been here almost a year. I got here on May 17th and we're talking here at the end of April. So I'm about two weeks almost three weeks away from being here a year and it's been a great year and we've made a real difference and I'm excited about the next five or six years and what we can do. When you look at your time back when you were in Congress, what kind of uh, dramatic changes did you see throughout your tenure and how do you see that evolving in the future? Well, you know, as much as Congress changes, it always kind of stays the same because Congress reflects America. And the people in Congress generally reflect the districts they represent. They might be a Republican or a Democrat, but they are of the people and, and they represent the people. But I, while I was there, I got there in 2011, elected in 2010, and left uh, last year in 2021. So I've really seen 
um, almost 11 years of change. So, you know, I, I, when I got elected, uh, Barack Obama was president. Obviously, uh, Donald Trump was elected president while I was there. And then uh, Joe Biden was elected uh, at the end of my time there. So it was three different administrations with very different uh, focus or foci and very different public faces. So it, it was really interesting to watch. And, and Congress, as much as anything else, just like America, is a response to what's going on lots of times in the administration. Uh, and so, you know, I watched the Republicans take over and I was sworn in as part of the class of 2010 that Republicans took over Congress and we uh, stayed in control through almost my entire time there. We, we lost the majority in 2018. So for the last uh, two years I was there, we were in the minority, but most of the time I was there, I was in the majority and able to pass legislation and get things done. But even when I was in the minority, uh, I was somebody who could work with Republicans and Democrats and get things done. That bill I just talked about, the Pause Act, was actually uh, passed the House twice when President Trump was in office, but did not pass the Senate, uh, passed the House again uh, when President Biden was there. The Senate finally passed it, and uh, it was signed into law by President Biden, not President Trump. Uh, and I was a Republican that was the lead sponsor on that bill. So I was uh, proud of the fact that I could get something done regardless of who was in power, because, you know, if you've got something that can help a lot of people, hopefully it doesn't become a partisan issue. And it didn't become a partisan issue. Republicans and Democrats from both the House and the Senate supported it throughout the time that I was there. And I, I feel confident that President Trump would have signed it into law, but President Biden did sign it into law. So I think the good news is uh, I still believe the system generally works. Big things are hard to get done, but if you can do something that's going to help people, uh, you can still build a bipartisan coalition and get things done. And, you know, I wish we weren't as divided as a country as we are now, uh, but the way we can change that is by doing little things we can agree on. And then every time we do something, do something a little harder and a little harder. And eventually maybe we can get the hard things done. No, I think a lot of people are looking for that, people to work together. I think they're kind of tired of the, the fighting, you know? Yeah, it would, fighting is, it's important to fight for your values, but in the end, nothing gets done until people work together uh, and find a common goal. That's one of the things that I learned in the military is, you know, focus on the mission first and make sure you focus on getting things done. And that's uh, something I've tried to take with me in my civilian careers, uh, whether I was serving the people in the state Senate, whether I was uh, serving in Congress or now, um, you know, serving our members of the Ohio Chamber and trying to make Ohio uh, a better place. So talking about your current role, what is the biggest challenges facing Ohio businesses today? Well, you know, I would say there's really three things that we hear from every employer. Number one is about workforce and getting employees that they can count on that have the skills, uh, even getting any employees, but then getting the skills, the employees that have the skills they need and the soft skills of showing up, doing a good job, caring about their, their work and having a good work ethic. Uh, the second thing that we hear the most about is about the supply chain and inflation and the costs of goods sold and everything going on, whether it's oil prices going up or labor prices going up or raw material prices going up. That's a giant issue and inflation is um, bigger than it's been in uh, almost 40 years right now. And it's uh, something that every business has on the top of their mind right now because it's impacting their ability to do their job. And then the third thing that we're hearing about again that took a dip during COVID but is back is the cost of healthcare. And I think that's something that's gonna continue to be a bigger conversation into 2023 because as we look at the inflation we're seeing in the economy now, most healthcare contracts are set for a year, a year ahead. Mm -hmm. So the, the cost drivers usually lag by about a year. So all this inflation we're seeing in the economy now, we'll see in healthcare next year. And I expect that to be the biggest topic of conversation in 2023 is the cost of healthcare. Now, how does Ohio compare to other states? Well, on workforce, I'd say every state's, you know, uh, in 
uh, a little bit of the same pickle. We have more jobs in America than we have workers that are unemployed. And so there are job shortages, and especially in fields like technology, in uh, manual labor jobs, in restaurant jobs, in service sector jobs, in retail jobs, there are huge shortages and giant problems. And then healthcare and nursing and things like that. So that we have sectors of our economy that I think are, are um, having trouble no matter what part of the country you're in. Uh, Ohio uh, could do better in some things. You know, there's 3.5 million Ohioans that grew up in Ohio that don't live in Ohio anymore. So we have 11 and a half million people in our population. But if all those people had stayed in Ohio, we'd be 15 million people. And we'd have the workers we need for almost any job that is out there. And so we need to work to not only bring some of those three and a half million people back to Ohio, but to get people from other states to move to Ohio. And uh, that's a concerted effort that the chamber is getting involved in to create a public-private partnership to encourage more people to move to Ohio to help us fill the jobs that we have. And of course, we're working to get people the training they need if they want a job but don't have the job they want, make training more accessible to people so they can get a better job and move up in this economy. Uh, we got the state to put $50 million in something called tech cred that can help people get credentials that uh, whether you're an existing employee or new employee, you can access the tech cred program to pay your tuition and help you increase your skills and get a better job. And so it's a great program and it's um, helped hundreds and hundreds of people and hopefully over time, it's going to help thousands of people get better jobs in Ohio and live a better life in Ohio. Uh, so on workforce, we're very similar to the rest of the country. I would argue uh, the same thing with inflation and, um, and with health care costs. You know, that's going up everywhere. It's really international and national drivers, both all the money that uh, we spent out of Washington through the COVID pandemic, as well as supply chain issues and employment shortages that are driving uh, the inflation that's in our economy today. And healthcare costs are mostly national issues, although we are convinced there may be some good state solutions in the future that can help put Ohio toward uh, the front of healthcare and make healthcare more efficient here and therefore make Ohio a place where people want to come. Do you think the reputation of Ohio has shifted in the last five years? I think in the last six months, Ohio's reputation has really shifted. With Intel coming here, you know, when people used to talk about Ohio, what did they say? They called it the Rust Belt. Um, that is um, an image in your mind of a declining place where things are sitting idly by and rusting. Uh, the good news is we still make things in Ohio, and Intel decided they want us to make microchips here. So, you know, this image of the Silicon Heartland. Uh, is a rising image. And people are saying, hey, why aren't we looking at Ohio? Intel just chose Ohio. So we're seeing the deal flow of new businesses that want to come to Ohio increasing even faster, which puts more pressure on the workforce and uh, helps make that idea I talked about of getting more people to come here even more important. So um, it's uh, the image of Ohio has changed pretty significantly just in the last six months. So working with a lot of business owners, what kind of mistakes do you typically see them make? Well, you know, it, there are different mistakes that people make in different uh, growth cycles for a company. The, the biggest mistake we see in smaller companies is, you know, they're good at growth and their growth outruns their cash. And that creates a giant problem where a company can become insolvent and actually go out of business, not because they couldn't grow, but because they grew too fast. Uh, that's something that is uh, a giant uh, issue that we see for startup and young companies. But the other thing that I see a lot of companies do is they get away from their customer and they don't focus on meeting the needs of their customer. And when you're not meeting the needs of your customer, you're putting your business at a giant risk. And I think those are the, some of the biggest mistakes that we see later in a company's life is not focusing on what their customers want and need, but focusing on what they think they want to do. Uh, you know, if you listen to your customers and give your customers what they want, you're going to do just fine. So when people join the chamber, 
what are the expectations that some businesses have that the chamber would do that may not do? So, uh, I, you know, I think uh, there's, I'll get, there's really three reasons to join the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. If you're a small company and you want to access our money saving programs, uh, we have a health insurance program uh, from any company that has two to 50 employees that can save people about 25% of setting up their own health insurance. And uh, that's uh, been a great growth driver for the chamber. And I think it's an important benefit we can provide to small businesses that have a tough time in the healthcare market. We also provide for people that are in the state fund of worker, workers' compensation, a group buying program in workers' comp that can save people about 20% on their workers' comp rates. Uh, and if you're not self-insured, usually companies over 500 people are usually self-insured. Uh, but if you're a smaller company, 500 or below, they're usually in the state fund, although we've seen some bigger employers moving away from self-insured toward the state fund lately. Um, and um, we can get those people uh, a break on their, um, on their workers' comp. And in most, both that and the health insurance case, those savings more than pay for the dues at the chamber. So it's, uh, those are pretty straightforward and easy things. Uh, a second reason to join the chamber is to network if you're a B2B business and you wanna meet other businesses. And um, you know, usually um, we hold uh, about 12 to 15 events a year now. And uh, if you wanna network with other companies, those are great opportunities to do it. And uh, we've seen that work obviously during COVID, there were less in-person events and that made it harder for, to do some of the networking that some of the businesses wanted. Uh, but uh, we moved some of those online. We've, we've gone back to doing everything in person with a virtual option for people that are further away. What we've learned from the virtual option is, gee, if somebody was in Cleveland or Cincinnati and the event happens to be in Columbus or if we hold an event in Cleveland because we're the state chamber and somebody from Cincinnati wants to come, you know, that's a five hour drive from Cincinnati to Cleveland, but they can do it virtually and connect. And so uh, we have continued the virtual option, uh, but it's not as good for real networking because real networking uh, works better when you can really see the whites of somebody's eyes and shake somebody's hand and build a personal relationship and get to know somebody. But it, it's, um, it's not as good, but it's better than nothing. So we have uh, continued that option and it's working pretty well. The, the other reason that we people join the chamber is we have more uh, lobbyists than every other business association combined. And uh, we have 12 lobbyists that are over at the state house every day. And there are a lot of companies who have issues that are important to them on advocacy. They're something that needs, they need to help their customers or their own bottom line, maybe a state law that's in the way or something they think can do better, be done better. That's something we work on every day to advocate for our members. And it's, uh, it's been uh, great to have that kind of experience with people. Uh, we publish a top 10 list of bills at the beginning of every session. We published it in uh, January of uh, 2021. And I'm proud to say that six of those bills have been signed into law by the governor. And there's one or two more we think might be passed from our top 10 list. Uh, before November of, or December of 2022. So, um, you know, being a little over two thirds of the way through a legislative session and having six of our top 10 bills signed into law feels pretty good right now. Oh, no, that's a huge win. I think that's yeah. great. So what do you think the future of the workplace looks like? Well, you know, we've all experienced a lot of interesting stuff through COVID in the workforce. Place. And so work from home, I think, is a movement that is, uh, and flexible work uh, space is something that's here to stay. Although I think at the next economic downturn, um, it will slightly uh, go away uh, or become less prevalent. Because I think if you, let's say I'm a business, and today we're seeing a lot of businesses based out of New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles. Um, come to Ohio and, you know, try to get employees from Cleveland or Columbus or Cincinnati or Toledo or Dayton or Youngstown or some small market, Lancaster, Ohio, and get the people to work from home for the big company out of one of those towns. You know, if you're from New York, you can afford to pay somebody 
more than they're making in Ohio by maybe 10 or 20%, but it's still less than what you'd pay somebody in New York City. And you don't have to have an office in New York City that's super expensive because the person's going to work from home. So there's almost zero overhead. Um, so I think work from home is, is going to be a movement that will continue for a while because those companies out of Chicago and New York and Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. get access to a labor pool they didn't have before in Columbus or Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, But I will tell you at the next economic downturn, when you've got people that I look at every day, if I'm that employer in New York, uh, I'm probably not going to lay them off. I'm probably going to lay off the people that work from home first because, you know, I don't have to look them in the eye and lay them off. I send them an email saying you're laid off or I might call them, but it's not the same painful experience. So there, I would give some caution to people that work from home that I think at the next economic downturn, they'll be easier to lay off. Um, uh, but I do think work from home in some capacity and hybrid work is going to be here to stay. Um, and I also think that uh, you're seeing employers increase the flexibility. We have some members that have moved to a four-day work week. Now, I don't think every employer will move to, the, to a four-day work week over the next 10 years, but I think you'll see employers be more flexible and you'll see more people that um, are working a four-day work week, four tens, and that's it. Um, and then the employer will have the people working, you know, maybe three or four days the other way, and you'll end up with, um, you know, uh, a workforce that uh, is uh, a little different than we have today. But I think that's one of the things you'll see is a more flexible workforce into the future that meets the needs of the business and the employee. And um, so I think you'll see more um, hybrid work schedules, some work from home, some four-day work weeks. I think while business and work will not fundamentally change, you'll see more flexibility over the next few years. So we work with large and small companies. And sometimes we hear, you know, a lot of the, their employees want, you know, higher pay and they really fight for that. But when you're a smaller company, it's very hard to sustain staying in business. There's a point where you're just going to tap out. Yeah. What can smaller to mid-sized companies do in that scenario? Well, I think uh, there are pluses and minuses of working for smaller and bigger corporations. You know, bigger companies have uh, a little more financial wherewithal. You might make a little more money, but at a smaller company and, and more than half the members of the Ohio Chamber, about 5,000 of our 8,000 members are small businesses. Uh, small businesses can compete in that they have a much more collaborative nature in many cases. They have much less uh, bureaucracy. You can make a bigger difference at a smaller company. In many ways, you can move up faster at a smaller company. Uh, and I think um, our small members are getting very creative with things like profit sharing and bonuses. And the base pay might not go up, but as the productivity or outcomes at the company go up, our smaller businesses are figuring out how to share that upside with their employees in a way that makes them very competitive with big businesses. So since you've had a wide variety of different experiences, what would be your next? What's the next? That's, you know, that's a great question. And I'm not looking for a job. I don't know that I will be looking for a job uh, anytime soon, but I think where I can add value long-term is to be on corporate boards and give the uh, benefit of my experience in the public and private sector uh, to companies that that are looking for board experience uh, and somebody that has a wide variety of, uh, of experience and opportunities. So I, uh, we'll see, but I, I would expect over the next 10 years to go on a few corporate boards. Uh, those aren't full-time work, they're part-time work. So I could probably do that and continue to stay here at the chamber. I have no, uh, no plan to leave the Ohio chamber anytime soon. I, I just got here to me, it feels like. Yeah, right. So my last question is, when it's all said and done, what kind of legacy would you like to leave? My legacy, I hope, is to make Ohio a better place. Uh, make Ohio a place where everybody can live their economic dream, regardless of their starting circumstances, you know, what zip code they were born in, what their race or gender is. I want Ohio to be a place where everybody can live their economic dream. 
And that's why I think my role at the chamber is just as important as some of the things I did when I was in Congress or the state Senate, because I think giving people uh, economic opportunity is the biggest game changer we can make. Uh, because if people can uh, make their way in this world and make enough money, they can do whatever their own dream is. And I don't need to tell people what their dreams are. They have their dreams. I just want to facilitate those and have them come through, come true by making Ohio a place where they can do well financially and then live their dream life. Understood. That sounds like a pretty awesome legacy. <laughs> I hope we can make it come true. That's my goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate your time and thank you so much uh, for coming to our podcast. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please hit subscribe so you can get notified when new content comes out. Please share this with anyone who could be inspired by it and feel free to post any questions so we can be inspired by new content. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in learning more, visit our website at bakercreative.co.